Welcome everyone. Today's Frontiers in Miniature Brain Machinery seminar lecture will be given by Dr. Neil Cohen. Dr. Cohen is a member of the UIEC faculty here. He is the founding director of the Interdisciplinary Health Sciences Institute, direct for, director for the Center of Nutrition, Learning and Memory. He is a professor here on campus in the Department of Psychology. He also works with the Beckman Institute and the Carl Illinois College of Medicine. His research focuses on identifying and characterizing the brain's memory systems through many different interdisciplinary functions such as computational modeling and patient studies. Today he will be presenting his seminar entitled Memory, Disorders of Memory in the Human Brain. Thank you and welcome Dr. Cohen. Thank you so much, Taylor, and thanks folks for coming out today. Um, let me uh, give you uh, uh, my overly, I suspect overly ambitious uh, roadmap here. Um, let's say I will touch on the following topics. Um, first about what is memory, how is it stored in the brain, how to study it. And then the second, the particular way that my work has emphasized which is learning about normal memory from the study of memory disorders, and then confirming those lessons using converging approaches. Third, what memory disorders in particular have taught us about multiple memory systems. And the course of doing that, uh, talk about the role of the hippocampus or the memory system dependent on, in particular on the hippocampus. Uh, we'll talk about some theory and then, uh, and then some data, and then time permitting, I want to get to the point about uh, the very same brain system, the hippocampus that's so susceptible to damage and amnes amnesia, turns out to be a promising target for plasticity throughout the lifespan. And uh, in talking about that can present some data from intervention studies, which helps actually to uh, both confirm the things you learned from amnesia and end on a very positive note. Um, so I'm going to jump in and I'm going to um, uh, probably go a little too fast, but let's start with this. I think many, um, many people, or certainly people in the neurosciences, have seen figures like this one, uh, which show uh, the different levels of analysis or the different levels uh, of organization of the nervous system um, from very, from small, from very small spatial and temporal scale genes and molecules to synapses and neurons and collections of neurons that form circuits and maps, and then systems of those networks uh, that collectively comprise the brain. And in the, in the field of neuroscientists, people tend to work in different levels, trying to understand mechanisms at each of those different temporal and spatial scales. The thing that's amazing about the study of memory is that um, in the study of memory, people are working, different people are working at each of those levels. And it is clear that each of those levels have part, has part of the answer to the question of what is memory. Plasticity, the ability of the brain to change as a function of experience occurs at all of these levels. So the whole brain is plastic and the whole brain does memory, if you will, but there are also some specialized memory systems. So in that right panel, I'm gonna show you the level we're at. We're gonna be at a pretty high level today, not molecules or synapses or individual neurons, but rather collections of neurons that form maps and systems that together, that all together comprise the central nervous system. And what those systems, what, what aspects of memory those systems support. So a little bit of a roadmap. Now, my favorite description of memory comes from the playwright Tennessee Williams, who wrote, life is all memory, except for the one present moment that goes by so quickly, you can hardly catch it going. So there's this moment, and everything else is memory. And the question that we ask is, what are the brain mechanisms that help you catch that before it goes by? And part of what I want to tell you today is we learn a tremendous about, amount about normal memory, about the mechanisms that allow us to catch each present memory as it goes by so that we can store the records of our lives. We learn so much about that from studying cases of disordered memory. 
Uh, I'll start as, uh, as many in my field do with the patient known by his initials HM. HM uh, died uh, in 2008, but before that he was the most intensively studied and famous neurological patient in the world. But he didn't know that because his, his impairment, the, the aspect of his neurological disorder that made him famous was an amnesia that prevented him from learning and remembering who was studying him or why people were studying him, much less what we all learned from him. He was studied for over five decades and made immense contributions, um, which we can talk about now. Who is he? Why, do, why, why did he become so important? In 1953, he underwent surgical removal of the hippocampus and related structures for the relief of what was otherwise medically intractable epilepsy. He was taking near lethal doses of uh, of his medication, anti-seizure medication, which still was not enough to, to stop his seizures. So they performed an experimental surgery that removed uh, a good portion of the hippocampus and, and um, related structures in the medial temporal lobe. And in the le lower left-hand panel, that region that's lighting up from blue to orange is the hippocampus. And it's, it's buried deep into the temporal lobes. Uh, two panels over is a cross section of that structure and you see the shape of it, this um, curved shape of it, which to the old anatomist looked like a seahorse, which in Greek is hippocampus, hence the name of that region, the hippocampus. Um, so this was a, um, a scheduled surgery. He had no memory impairment, but profound memory impairment before the surgery. They knew exactly what they removed during the surgery. And the surgery, the good news is that it helped his seizure disorder greatly, but it left him unexpectedly with a profound and permanent deficit in learning and memory of new facts and events. Everyone who came in contact with him, and I was lucky enough to spend a number of years um, working with him, uh, uh, saw that he forgot events almost as quickly as they occur. That is the thing that Tennessee Williams was talking about that we were talking about what are the mechanisms that catch those events before they go away forevermore. That's what was impaired in HM. He was studied uh, continuously over the course of 55 years. And I can tell you, this is a man who did not know where he was living uh, at the time we interacted with him, did not know his age or current date, didn't know anything about his parents who were long since deceased could not report any history since his surgery in 1953, or in fact, since some period before that, and was profoundly impaired on any number of formal tests of memory for words or pictures or faces or roots or nonsense material shapes, tunes, tones, personal events, public events, and more. A very profound and debilitating memory impairment. Now remember, this is the day, but in the days before MRI or CT scans, so what made him so special is that we knew exactly what region of the brain was damaged because it came from a surgical procedure and the surgeon's note provided the notes of what was removed, provided the blueprint for understanding the relationship between this portion of the brain and the aspects of memory that were impaired with him. Over time, over those 55 years, eventually he was studied with CT scans and MRI scans and eventually came to autopsy so we could see his brain. And um, the arrows there in the, the MRI scans, uh, uh, there's two, there's a left and right column of those MRI scans and the right uh, and orange um, arrows pointing the way. In the right column, you see um, a brain of a healthy intact control and the orange points to a portion of the brain there, the hippocampus, our friend, the hippocampus. In the left column, you see in HM holes in that portion of the brain where his hippocampus used to be, just like in the surgeon's notes. And in the lower right, you see a slice of his brain after he came to autopsy. And again, you see the hole in that portion of the brain, the removal of the hippocampus. So we can tie the hippocampus to his loss of memory, which was in fact so profound. Now it isn't just HM, the hippocampus, damage to the hippocampus is a common factor in amnesia. 
So in addition to the hippocampus being the critical brain region and its surrounding structures in the medial temporal lobe, in addition to it being the critical region damaged in his surgery causing his amnesia, it's a region of the brain in which damage usually starts in Alzheimer's disease. And then, which is, a, as you know, a progressive disease, which gradually includes more regions of the brain. And what I'll tell you in the end, what we've learned during these years through studies of these patients and others, is that this is the brain region critical for creating enduring, new enduring memories and for retrieving them later. And then we'll tell you more about that now. So amnesias following damage to the hippocampal system include both HM, um, Alzheimer's disease, and any other way um, in which that region of the brain is damaged through strokes, through viral encephalitis, uh, et cetera. I noted that in Alzheimer's disease, the progressive cognitive decline we all know about, um, it typically starts with memory impairment. Um, damage usually starts in the medial temporal lobes and then expands. And that expansion is causing the, the uh, aspects of the, of the cognitive decline that extend beyond what HM ever showed. And um, this, is, this particular patient over the years uh, was, was, an, was an artist. And over time, he drew a series of self-portraits. And as you go from the upper left to the lower right, you see the progressive, you see that his self-portrait showing the progressive advance of his disease. Despite the profoundness of HM's impairment and the impairment you see in Alzheimer's disease, there are some aspects of memory that are fully preserved in amnesia. As far back as 1962, Brenda Milner described an example of this in HM. And in this image, I'm, I'm showing you a task on the left. Uh, it's mirror drawing. Um, what the individual has to do is trace that star, keeping the stylus inside the outlines of the star but they can't see their hand directly or the star directly. They can only see it through a mirror. And the left-right reversal of the mirror makes this really, really hard. You keep getting st stuck initially at these choice points until you finally learn the skill of drawing through a mirror. And on the right, you see um, um, the performance in terms, in this case, the performance of how many times he falls outside of the lines initially on, and this was done over the course of three days, Initially, he falls outside the lines, moving slowly, falling outside the lines a whole lot. And over the course of three days, almost never makes any errors over three successive days. Yet in HM, he had no idea on each day that he had ever seen this before or performed this the day before. And yet here he is showing remarkable learning, fully preserved learning. This is something I followed up in my thesis work which was, as you can see from the, the state, a really long time ago. And in this case, it's not mirror drawing, but mirror reading. So if you look at the box in the upper left, you see three words in mirror reverse text. And your job is to read them as quickly as you can from right to left. And it's really hard to read from right to left, um, uh, in, in this backwards text. And I used a font that makes it particularly hard. The words are capricious, the draggled and grandiose. And in the study, you see a long series of these triplets after triplet after triplet. Some are seen only once, never to be seen again. Some are repeated multiple times. And on the right, what you're seeing is performance uh, showed by how long it takes to read the set of uh, a whole set of triplets. In the left column, when they're seen only once, in the right column, when they're seen multiple times, in uh, dark is uh, one of our amnesic patients, and in the open circles is uh, our normal controls. Uh, in, uh, uh, in each of three types of amnesias. And what you see is remarkably intact, preserved learning. They get better and better, even though they don't remember doing so. They come back three months later, way too long for them to remember having ever done this before, and yet show remarkable facility, getting better and better at reading uh, mirror reverse text, showing fully preserved learning and retention of their skills, but they cannot recollect or introspect about the learning experiences that remember doing it before or the content of their experiences. They don't know why they seem to be doing well. They can't explain what it is they've learned because they don't remember having done it before. This sounds awfully reminiscent 
of the storyline in the Bourne Identity and other movies in the Bourne franchise. Um, and I stole this little quote from their website. It says, he has the skills of a dangerous man, but he doesn't remember his past. And the, you know, what the plot of the movie is about is how can that be? How is it possible? He's this action figure. He's this CIA trained uh, assassin and he's retained all the skills, but he doesn't remember his past. How can that be? Well, I think of HM as an action hero too. Here he is on the right. And what I would say is he can learn new skills normally, but he cannot remember any of his experiences. How can that be? And as scientists, the question we ask is, what does it teach us about memory? And what we've concluded is what it teaches us is that there are multiple memory systems of the brain, that the hippocampus and the systems damaged in HM are part of one memory system that, it's about, that is about remembering the experiences, the events of your life in an, an explicit way, a way you can declare. It involves the hippocampus and, and other regions in the medial temporal lobe all attached to the cerebral cortex of the brain, but that this is just one of several memory systems. Here I, I uh, show you three, my colleague Eichebaum and I show you three different ones. Um, I won't talk about the other two today, just this one, the declarative or relational memory system tied to the hippocampus. The lesson is that there are multiple memory systems. Let me tell you a little bit more about this one. So the idea is that the declarative or relational memory system is what supports our memory for the who, what, where, and when of events. The binding together, the constituent elements of experience. Um, this depends critically on the hippocampus. So different aspects of an event, where you were, different things you'd seen in what order, uh, your emotional reaction, your actions through the event, all are processed by different regions of the cortex. And these different regions of the cortex all converge onto the hippocampus. So the hippocampus in interaction with these neocortical sites, the neocortical sites processing and storing the information, converge with the hippocampus to bind those different elements together and permit their subsequent retrieval. And this is different from procedural memory, for example, which is memory supporting the ability to acquire and use skills. Like I showed you with mirror drawing or mirror tracing, that's in the laboratory, but for us in real life, the ability to play tennis or play the guitar or type or, or dance, all of those depend upon different regions of the brain, not the hippocampus, that per, su supporting the ability to acquire and use skills, even if we can't remember the details. They're preserved in amnesia. Okay, let me give you a quick example. This coming weekend, the quarterback Tom Brady, who was uh, who, who many of you will know, played for the uh, the Boston, pa the New England Patriots for 20 years, then went to New England, then went to uh, Tampa Bay, where he won another championship, is coming back to New England this weekend to confront his former coach, Bill Be Belichick. Imagine he and Giselle and Bill Belichick are, are touring Boston during Tom's trip back to Boston, and they see the various sites of Boston, these and others. How is that going to be remembered? Well, the hippocampus is supporting the ability to bind the different elements of experience together. Experience within this event and across of events, bind them together and bind the different events together by having it converge onto the hippocampus. And then storing a record of those, then later when reminded of one or another elements of the experience, here Faneuil Hall, Quincy Market, that reaches out to the hippocampus and the hippocampus then re-engages, reactivates the full complement of the, of the elements of the previous experience or previous experiences and reactivates the memory. So that's our notion of relational memory and how it's supported by these systems of the brain. So that's theory, that's a high level description. Let's look at some data. How do we know this to be, the tr to be true? How do we see this in action? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna take you through a couple of examples of this, very concrete examples. 
And uh, the punchline will be amnesia is a deficit of relational memory. Amnesia following hippocampal damage is a deficit of relational memory because the hippocampus is a critical factor in supporting relational memory. In this experiment uh, done here at Illinois by Debbie Hanula and, and Jen Ryan and others, um, individual participants in studies see a series of pretty scenes with pretty faces, and they need to remember which faces go specifically with which scenes. And then at test time, they see um, these various scenes and a set of three faces. And in each case, the set of th the three faces will all have been seen before. Um, uh, but sometimes one of those faces will match that scene. That is, when that face was seen before, it was seen with that particular scene. Other times, none of the three faces was seen with that scene. Other times, none of the three faces were ever seen before. And I'm telling you this in some detail because this is hard. In any given test trial, all three faces are equally familiar. But in some test trials, one of those faces was studied with that scene. Your job is to pick out which face was studied with that scene. And if you're a participant in this study, you don't get the benefit of the red box that I drew around the face here. So uh, it's, a, it's a difficult study. How do people do? In this instance, the way we tested memory was through procedures we developed to use eye movement where you look on the screen to help us determine what you remember and what you don't remember. So we monitor the eyes while you're viewing the screen, while you see these various test displays. In the right panel, we see that same test display that I showed you first. Here, with eye movements and eye fixation superimposed, the circles, the red circles are where your eyes fixated, stop for a little while. The yellow lines are your eye movements that take you from one fixation to another. So as you view the world, you do so in a series of fixations, and I'm projecting them here onto these faces. Okay, and what you see here is disproportionate viewing of the face that matches the scene. In the middle panels, the actual data, the proportion of viewing time for the face that matches compared to the face that doesn't match, faces that do not match. And what happens is very quickly, within half a second, people start viewing disproportionately to the face that matches the scene. So this is an example of relational memory, face-scene relations. You don't have to respond verbally. This is a task which can be performed in animals, not just in humans. So it provides a way to cut across different species. And you see this in person after person, except in amnesic patients with hippocampal damage, the teal, the, the very light colored one, there's no difference in viewing between the matching face and other faces. Okay. So the hippocampal, hippocampus is critical to this aspect of relational memory. Here's another example, instead of using eye movements, um, here they're shown the same scenes and faces, and then the test trials occur either very close in time to a study trial, or further along in time after a lag of intervening items after the, the study trial. So lag one, lag five, lag nine. In experiment two, it's faces, the lower panel on the right, it's faces again. In the upper panel, you're looking at scenes and objects. So object scene memory or face scene memory. And we're looking at in the white bars, uh, normal folks, intact folks versus in the dark panels, patients with damage to the hippocampus following anoxia. And what we see is profound impairment of relational memory and amnesia, even at the shortest lag, even if there's only one intervening item between the study of the item and the test of the item, patients with hippocampal damage are already impaired at this aspect of relational memory. Um, I mentioned to you um, earlier that, that um, it's, the hippocampus is critical to bind these, the information together, relational memories together. It's also critical for reactivating them upon, uh, at, at test time. So in this work, a follow-up to the work I showed you by, Deborah ha by Debbie Hanula, um, it's the same stimuli and this, uh, at stu same kind of stimuli at study and the same kind of stimuli at test, but at test time, there is a delay between when you see the scene that might cause you to reactivate your memory for what 
faces, what face went with that scene, there's a delay period. And these individuals are in an MRI scanner and they're measuring brain activity during the delay. Down in the lower panels, what we see is activation of the hippocampus and the surrounding cortical areas during the delay in a way that predicts subsequent performance. So on trials when people successfully move their eyes to the correct face, the hippocampus activates during the delay. That activation of the hippocampus during the delay is mediating their subsequent eye movement to the faces. And this is true whether or not people can actually accurately report verbally what they had seen. So in this case, the eyes know even when the individual may not know. And, and that performance is tied to, is shown via the eye movements, critically dependent on the hippocampus, our friend that supporting relational memory. I'm gonna give you another example of this, maybe easy, easier to get your head around. In each, uh, and this is by Patrick Watson, who is a student uh, in neurosciences here and then a postdoc, in, you see a, a, a small number of, of these squiggles of some kind of object, in this case, five objects in the study phase, then four seconds delay, and then all the objects are put up at the top, and your job is to put them with the mouse, move the objects to where they belong uh, on, on the screen. Where did they occur originally? It's only a four second delay. You only have to remember five objects but you have to put them back in the same spatial locations in which you first studied them. So here you can see how we look at this. The study display is in the upper left. Here's an example of a, re of a reconstructed output. Um, and there are different kinds of errors you could make. You could have an object just off by a little bit, a little to the left, a little bit to the right, a little higher, a little lower. Or there's a certain kind of error in which two objects are in the, where objects are incorrect Objects are in locations that had been filled, but they've been swapped. So the right objects in the wrong locations. Um, so it's a swap error. It's a, it's a misbinding, we believe, of objects to their location. And the data across all individuals is shown in the right. Patients with amnesia following hippocampal damage in this instance had 40 times more swap errors than normal folks did. Normal folks almost never make this kind of error with that shorter delay. Patients with this, whereas it is utterly diagnostic of amnesia to make a massive number of such errors, swap errors, relational memory failures. We've used this procedure to look at lots of other uh, patient groups, lots of other individuals. Here I show you work with um, Melissa Duff, who is, um, uh, at Vanderbilt uh, in patients with traumatic brain injury, but who are very highly functioning, functioning, they're back at work. They don't complain of memory impairment. Uh, and yet on this task, they show impaired relational memory. So the teal color is their accuracy. Look in the right panel, it's, uh, it is a completely different distribution than the, the pinker, more coral color of normal comparison individuals. They're worse than the normal comparison individuals on spatial relational memory, but on standardized tests, actually the official NIH toolbox test of memory, they're perfectly normal. They show highly overlapping distributions with comparison subjects. So this is a very sensitive test of hippocampal function because it taps into what we think is the heart of hippocampal function, relational memory. Here's another example in same task. Now in um, healthy elderly, just normal aging, as a function of how often these individuals complain subjectively of memory problems. So we call them subjective memory complaints. And what I'm showing you in this chart is if you, if you order the different um, individuals by how many subjective memory complaints they make, those who have the highest number of subjective memory complaints, who have the most concern about their memories, show the greatest number of errors on this task. 
That is, there is a strong relationship between this actual formal test of relational memory and their introspective sense of, of um, uh, the beginnings of memory impairment. All of these people are normal for their age. They don't show clinical symptoms. If they went to a memory imp impairment clinic or an Alzheimer's clinic, they would be put into the normal category. But yet the variation in their introspective sense of their memory is predicted by or relates very strongly to performance on this test. Give you one more example of this. In, now in, in fully intact young individuals, here, this is work by Hilary Schwab and others at the Beckman Institute, uh, uh, was a postdoc now a research scientist, in which um, they put people in an MRI scanner and gently shook their heads, gently shook their heads, which makes the brain move in a surrounding fluid, producing what are basically shear waves. Think about throwing a rock into a pond and seeing the ripples that um, um, emanate in, in the pond. And if you threw different things with different densities into the lake, you would get different patterns. So looking at the patterns, you can estimate the density or the elast elastic, viscoelastic properties of each region. And it was possible to look at the viscoelasticity, the, the microstructural integrity of the hippocampus in particular through this process in the right panel. You do this very fancy computation to understand what the structural integrity of the hippocampus in the middle of the brain was and relate it to performance on the same spatial memory test. And what you see is an extraordinarily high relationship between the structural integrity of the hippocampus and relational memory function such that the higher the structural integrity, the better relational memory function in perfectly intact individuals. So you don't have to be an amnesic patient in order to see this relationship. But the work with the amnesic patient was our guidepost for looking in this direction. Okay, in work by Alex Conkle when he was at University of Illinois, um, there was a, a, um, an attempt to look at different kinds of relations. Here, there's a very complicated task. On each task, people saw three objects successively, each for three seconds, um, all novel computer-generated objects in one of three locations uh, in three different temporal locations. So first one object in one location, then a different object in a different location, and finally a third object in a third spatial and temporal location. That's one trial and then another trial, and then another trial. So this too is a difficult task. At test time, you can test people's, from, people's memory for the items themselves independently of when and, or where they occurred. You can test people's memory for where, which spatial locations they were in, for when, which temporal slots they were in, or the associative relations, which things went together. And here you're looking at a performance chart, tall bars, higher bars show better performance in comparison, neurologically compact, uh, intact comparison patients. And here in patients with damage to the hippocampus. Patients with damage to the hippocampus do unbelievably poorly, at basically a chance for all of these different kinds of relations, spatial relations, temporal relations, and associative relations because memory for those relations depend upon this region, the hippocampus, which is damaged. Okay, so that's what happens when you see impairment to the hippocampus or when you measure the relationship of hippocampus activity in normal folks to, hip, to um, the function we attribute to the hippocampus. There's another way to look at this, to look at the relationship between hippocampus and and um, uh, memory performance. And that is to take advantage of the fact that whereas most regions of the brain do not grow any new neurons, do not have new neurons created uh, once development is complete, there are two regions of the brain, one of which is the hippocampus, which continues to create, to develop, to generate new neurons throughout the lifespan. So well past development, 
new gen, new new um, neurons can be genes can be generated, and that's called neurogenesis. It's usually studied in animals, and you could um, you um, can sacrifice the animals and slice the brain and look in the hippocampus and see the see brand new neurons, recently formed neurons, or in other ways. Um, um, uh, 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 get a look at the, these new neurons being formed. In humans, what you can do is look at changes in the volume of the hippocampus as a function of experience or some intervention. And this line of work was begun, begun by Eleanor McGuire, McGuire at University College London in one of my all-time favorite studies. Um, she, looked at pay, she looked at individuals who were taxi cab driver, drivers in London. And if you've ever been in London, you know how complicated a city that is. And taxi cab drivers have to take tests to show their knowledge of the spatial relations of the streets in London. So you can get from any location at pickup to any location at drop off in a reasonable way at a reasonable time. And what she did was just look at people who were taxi drivers for different amounts of time, some who had been drivers for only a few months to some who had been taxi drivers for tens of years and showed that the volume of the posterior portion of their hippocampus was highly related to the amount of time they had been a taxi driver. Those who had been taxi drivers the longest had the largest enhancement of the volume of their hippocampus. So it's incredibly interesting or ironic or lucky for us that this region, which is so susceptible to damage and amnesia, is so highly capable of plasticity. And looking at this, we can confirm a link between hippocampus and relational memory in neurologically intact individuals. So let me show you a couple of studies we've done here. I can end with a couple of studies we've done here in that vein where we're doing interventions of some kind or another, or in otherwise looking in intact people in different portions of the lifespan at the relationship between the volume of our friend, the hippocampus, and the, the functional, its functional properties in supporting relational memory. So whether in pre-adolescent children or adolescents or older adults, and this is work by Laura, Ch Laura Chaddock and others here and Kirk Erickson and others here at Illinois. Um, in the left panel, lower fit kids had lower volume hippocampus, higher fit kids, higher volume hippocampus. In the middle for adolescents, whether the right hippocampus or the left hippocampus, the higher the aerobic fitness as measured by the maximum amount volume of oxygen they can move on a treadmill test, the higher the aerobic fitness, the higher the volume of the hippocampus. And finally, in older adults, the same thing, measuring aerobic fitness um, by seeing how much the volume of oxygen they can pass, the higher the aerobic fitness, the larger the hippocampus. And so this is true throughout the lifespan. Um, I showed you the relationship between memory performance to the structural integrity of the hippocampus. So here, what we're doing, this is work by Hilary Schwab again and others at Beckman here at Illinois. What we were able to show is strong relationship again between the elastic, hippocampal elasticity and memory performance and between hippocampal um, uh, elasticity and aerobic fitness. So the higher the aerobic fitness, the more, the better structural integrity of the hippocampus, the better the structural integrity of the hippocampus, the higher the memory performance. Tying hippocampus to relational memory in intact individuals. I'll give you one more example of many studies that have been done here relating nutritional intervention or nutritional lifestyle choices to um, relational memory. This is work by um, uh, Kelsey Hassevoort, who is a, a student in neurosciences here and is, is now a research development manager still here at Illinois, who looked at lutein, uh, the predominant carotenoid that comes from the diet, accumulates in the brain, and is measurable in the eye because it's a great antioxidant. It protects against ultraviolet light in the eye. And there's a way to measure it in the eye as a proxy for how much has accumulated in the brain. And using that same test 
of spatial memory involving reconstructing the location of a small number of objects. She was able to show the strong relationship between the amount of lutein in the diet as measured in the eye and relational memory performance. So higher lutein levels produces, produce better hippocampal relational memory. So that's a lot about humans, starting with patients, moving through non uh, amnesic patients, moving through to other kinds of patients, moving to fully intact individuals. But um, the larger enterprise shows converging findings across species, across tasks, across methods, and across disciplines. I obviously don't have the time to go through all possible examples of this, uh, but in this graph, I, in, this, in this figure, I've put together a number of things and I just want to point to a few, some of the ones I already showed you, other studies that show hippocampal activation that's related to relational memory performance, but also a large number of st studies in rodents, largely from my uh, colleague Howard Eichenbaum, that shows that damage to hippocampus damages relational memory in rodents, that shows that recordings from the hippocampus in rodents, in awake behaving rodents, predicts relational memory performance is highly related to relational memory performance. And in the lower left, um, this wonderful body of work from his lab and others showing that um, there are both place cells in the hippocampus that fire when the animals in particular spatial locations and the same cells also code for time, time cells. They act as time cells. That is, they capture, they encode and record for posterity um, when something occurred in time and where something occurred in space. Exactly the kind of relational memory that we're talking about, capturing the elements um, of particular experiences. Now I saved you, um, uh, um, in, in case I was running late, I was gonna end here, but I'll show you one more little bit to just to give you a, bitter, a better sense of how we see relational memory in action. So that I'm gonna leave you with this idea, just play it out a little bit. The idea is that memory for relations among people, objects, places, actions, et cetera, that populate events as they unfold in their own temporal spatial context and among successive events as they with unfold within and across episodes, across time, are captured by the hippocampus in interaction with cortical storage sites. So events or episodes are made up of um, different spatial locations, different objects, they occur in different times, they um, are associated with different actions, they can occur in, in different larger contexts, all of which you sample while you move through the world, you sample through time and space, capture them as events, as episodes, as a series of events and episodes by virtue of the way the hippocampus encodes relational memory and then permits you to play them out later in time. I mentioned spatial locations. And um, I wanna leave you with this idea of how do we store a map, a spatial map, in this case of Boston. So ending where I, I began, think back to the Tom Brady example. How do you encode this? Is this related to what I just said about you're sampling the world and you're capturing different elements in different spatial locations and different moments in time and remembering them later? How do we see that? So when you first come to Boston, you encounter different locations one at a time. You see different objects during different paths, different routes, different, different um, experiences during your time in Boston, each with a different portion at a different time in a different location. And what you're doing, what your hippocampus is helping you do is tie those together so that you can put them together into a spatial map. If you're a taxi cab driver, that's exactly what you're doing in London, that's exact, or in Boston, 
That's exactly what you're doing in order to be able to navigate with expertise. But you don't have to be a taxi cab driver to do that. We all do that. We all tie together these different elements of experience, constituent elements of experience by virtue of the way the hippocampus captures these elements and uh, through its interactions with the cortex and stores them for later and then permits you to reactivate them. So with that, I wanna thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer questions. Um, I've described uh, various principles of the work I've described, but I wanna thank everyone involved in the memory systems lab, the IHSI Center for Nutrition, Learning and Memory, Carlo Illinois College of Medicine. And with that, I will stop sharing and happy to take any questions if you have them. Can I ask you a question here? Hello? Do you hear me? Uh, yes, Neil? yes, we hear you. Please go ahead. Yeah, amazing talk, Neil, amazing. I'm sorry I had to join a little bit later uh, for another meeting as usual. So the question is the, 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 the example- <laughs> I you... trust me, I, I've been there. Yeah, uh, I hope this is recorded and I can, I can pick up the first, uh, some of the uh, earlier part of the talk. Uh, really amazing. Uh, Quick question is it you are actually raising more questions than maybe answers, uh, which is typical of a, of a brain talk and, and a brilliant talk. So the driver example that you gave, where the driver is putting together, patching together the the images uh, as the driver drives around. So if the same driver would be also doing athletic activities, which is other example that you gave would you expect a nonlinear uh, change in the volume? And if you keep adding things that are related or correlated, uh, would they all um, add up to even better relational ca capabilities? And maybe right. right, that's a great question. We can only hope that that's true. So, um, you know, when I talk about what you can do to have a healthy hippocampus or mm -hmm. have a healthy brain, I talk about, um, you know, the obvious things, sleep well, eat well, and move well, mm -hmm. and have lots of novelty in your life. I think each of those four are great pieces of what can enhance brain health in general. And, and I think there's really good evidence for each of those four relating to hippocampus. There isn't, there is not great um, evidence that they're uh, multiplicative. Um, mm -hmm. I would suggest that's because uh, our methods of showing change are not as sensitive as they might be. But there is some work that, that shows in, in animals, in rodents again, that shows the trade-off between uh, nutrition and fitness. Mm -hmm. So um, animals with a better diet have better, better hippocampus. Animals with a lousy diet, but with more activity show a good hippocampus. Animals with very little activity, very, um, you know, raised in isolation and, and with very little access to running wheel, but with, good, <laughs> but with good nutrition have a pretty good, so they, you can see that those two factors trade off in that work. But in humans, um, I, we haven't seen all that much of it. Uh, there was a large study at Beckman for which um, Aaron Barbe was the PI and um, I, I was a member and, and Art Kramer and Chuck Hillman that looked at a number of these different elements and tried to look for some of those synergistic effects. They're hard to come by, I must say, to hear. But I am convinced <laughs> that um, rather than allowing them to trade off, we're mm -hmm. all better off aiming to, uh, you know, aspire to some high level on all of those. The, mm -hmm. the data await that though. Yeah, if I may follow up with another question and then I won't be asking another one, <laughs> which would be that you show a linear relationship, which seems to me that um, linear relationships are always a bit uh, scary because then you don't see the limits because I, I was expecting from your, analysis is that you reach a saturation point because either the yes. volume cannot 
increasing. So there must be some inhibitory factors coming in that uh, would eventually limit the capacity, right? Yeah, that's another really wonderful question. Um, so let me tell you two things I know about this. Uh, you're right, in the taxi cab studies, the, the very linear effects, and this has been replicated. Um, uh, three things I want to tell you. One, I, I mentioned it's posterior hippocampus. So the more driving, the better, the, the, the bigger posterior hippocampus is, better spatial memory is, but it's at the expense of anterior hippocampus. Mm. Those same people have smaller anterior hippocampus oh. and poorer memory for the aspects of memory that depend upon anterior hippocampus. So they find, this is McGuire and her group at UCL, so they find a trade-off. That's a real important point. Second mm -hmm. factoid from the nutrition work here done by Kelsey Hassevoort, Carol Bain, and, and others, um, the relationship between relational nutrition and relational memory is not all across the spectrum. It's only at the end point of the, let me say this differently. Um, people with poor fitness mm -hmm. show poor hippocampus. People across the normal range are pretty flat. Mm -hmm. Below a range, when your nutrition is below the normal range, when your fitness is below the normal range, then you start seeing this linear relationship in the okay. wrong direction. I'll just stick with those two. Okay. So okay. there are some nonlinearities or yeah. trade-offs that, that we see that I could point you to. Sure. All right. Thank you. Great talk. Thanks for your questions. Sure. Uh, Neil, I have a question. Um, uh, I work on the uh, AMP AMPA receptor in the hippocampus. Yeah. And uh, well, one thing that I'm interested in is, you know, you, you see me and you see that I have a beard. And then if I, you know, go away and then come back, you still remember that I have a beard. And so, and you may remember that for a day or a week or a month or something. And so, what is the relationship among those things? And it, you can form a memory in you know, a fraction of a second. And is that, in fact, a new AMPA receptors being created? Or is there some sort of working memory which doesn't involve any proteins being made and yeah yeah, yeah so. no the, yeah it's a great question you know obviously i'm working at the other end of that levels of analysis than your question um draws us to but i'm i'm happy to say a couple of things um um you know i th my starting point for your question is the following um plasticity occurs at all those levels and it occurs so there are there are phenomena that arise at all of those levels. And the hard part is understanding the bridges among those different phenomena. Are they all part of the same process? Is it a single cascade that starts with a particular receptor, particular channel, et cetera, et cetera. And then, and then over a period, you know, as the cascade unfolds, it's all leading inexorably to this particular kind of memory. I would argue not because we know there are different aspects of memory and different kinds of memory. So while the idea of a cascade is certainly true, things have to happen before there's a change in protein structure and in the structure of synapses, and they can carry the weight for a time, they're not all leading to the same kind of memory. So it'll be really important to understand whether you wanna know about memory for the face. In your example, or just say avoidance of a portion of a room that, get, that resulted in a shock, which doesn't require the same kind of high level cognitive capacity and can be manifested very early and be long lived. The hippocampus, the kind of memory that's gonna run through where the cascade's gonna run through the hippocampus um, is a place where on one trial, you can get changes that potentially last for a lifetime. I think that's what's special about that system. In the work, you asked about working memory, things that you only need to remember for a short time, 
like don't go in this direction while I'm moving through this space, that I'm gonna avoid that. I don't need to remember it ever again because I'm never gonna be here again, but I have to not lean in that direction or you know, things of that nature. Uh, sir, I would argue, can rely upon other short, faster acting, shorter lived mechanisms or faster earlier and shorter lived portions of the cascade. I'm not answering your question in detail, but, but um, it would be a mistake to imagine they're all part of the same, they're even part of the same family. So we'd wanna be really, really careful about that. Um, uh, that said, I think the challenge for all of us who are asking these kinds of questions is how do we bridge? What are the theories that permit us? What's the theoretical framework that will permit us to bridge those different levels? Which receptors, which channels, what time course, what kind of memory? That, that kind of um, analysis requires a certain kind of um, framework. Um, people like um, Gene Robinson and, and, um, and uh, Jonathan Swedler would point out to different time courses of different aspects of memory, things that involve gene changes, genetic or epigenetic changes operating on a much longer time scale than things that we can record with single cells or that manifest themselves in, in the activity of single receptors. So sorry to make it sound as richly complicated as it actually is, <laughs> but, <laughs> but these are great things to think about. We'd love to talk with you more about them. Okay, thank you. I see Katrina, you have your hand raised. Please go ahead and ask your question. Yes, thank you. So this is a little divergent, but still related to memory. So in individuals who have amnesia, it might be procedural memory if they over their lifetime learned to play an instrument, right? Something that was something they spent a lot of time on. But yep. for individuals who did not learn how to play an instrument and it wasn't a practice of theirs, would people with amnesia who don't have that skill set struggle with remembering melodies and certain songs? If does that fall under more procedural or memory, like uh, relational? Because they might have a memory of listening to it over and over again, but is that falling under more relational or more procedural because it's music? Yeah. So music really is special in a number of ways, and I know you know there's lots of ways neurologically. So, for example people with um, disorders that involve involuntary movements um, uh, can sing without the, can often sing without those involuntary movements. Or people with aphasia who have difficulty speaking individual words can sometimes uh, do nursery rhymes or sing because the elements of it are tied together in song, in the melody. And, um, the items in the melody, it's hard to unpack them individually. Once you learn a song, they are tied together. So, you know, if I ask you what letter comes after what, you know, uh, um, F in the, in, the, in the alphabet, you might have to either see an image of it or run the little thing in your head. If I ask you about a song, it's impossible just to immediately come up with what follows such and such in a, in a melody because the elements of the melody are all tied together. So music really is very procedural, even if you're not producing it, but certainly if you're producing it. One of the best studied amnesic patient, patients is a guy named Clive Waring, who was a musician. Um, and uh, he has profoundly impaired, profoundly impaired memory, and then goes back to the choir that he used to conduct and proceeds to play piano and conduct the choir. It's, it's, um, it's remarkable, just remarkable. So not a, not a divergent question at all, actually. <laughs> okay, we have time for one more question. Please go ahead, John. Yeah, hi, Neil. Hi, John. It's been a while since I saw you. Yeah. Still remember you though, thankfully. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I was wondering, uh, you started out with the Jason Bourne movies. So I was wondering if you had a, a wrap up to that or more to say about the different types of memory and, and what he goes through. Ah, yes. So um, like most, 
so I, for many, many years, I taught a course on, uh, you know, Hollywood in real life and Hollywood in the movies. It's now taught by Hilary Schwab, so it continues on. And um, bo the Bourne movies are brilliant in that distinction. And I, I take it very personally because the first book about the book by Ludlum on Bourne was the year after my thesis. <laughs> I don't believe you read my thesis, but was about this distinction between the procedural side of things and the, and the declarative relational side of things. That procedural memory is different and could be preserved. He is the heart of the Bourne thing. In Bourne, though, he doesn't remember his autobiography. And in a patient like HM, that's not true. HM knows who he is or knew who he was up to a certain point. And they conflated that. The typical Hollywood amnesia is this thing where you've lost your identity and it has great promise for a storyline if you don't remember who you are and all that. So Bourne is in some ways brilliantly correct and in other ways, you know, borrows some of the usual Hollywood tropes. The best is Memento or Nemo. Uh, the best in Finding Nemo are really great examples of amnesia, if you don't mind talking fish and, and movies that run backwards in time. But they, they actually capture um, the, the plight of an amnesic patient remarkably well. Dory does start to remember things, I think, in the second one, though, right? <laughs> yes, yes. He gets his memory back by the end of the franchise, and then they put a new character in there, and they can start all over again. So instead of uh, Matt Damon, it's now Jeremy Renner, and they get to do it all over again, as though we have amnesia. <laughs> we won't remember we've seen it all before. Anyway, thanks, everybody, for turning out today. Sorry, uh, Sophia, if I'm taking your role here. But <laughs> no, that's quite all right. Thank you so much. This has been fascinating. Great to see you all. Thank you.